And I'm like, oh, so I mean, we've been going, by the way. So whenever you're it's ready. recording, it's recording now to the cloud. I love Zoom because it records to the cloud. Yeah. So we're talking about your hair. Your e yes. is it emo? How, what what style is it? Is it emo or what? Because I'm so out of it. Emo's it, gay. It, okay. All right. It's not emo then. <laughs> no, no. Uh, I don't even know what emo means anymore because what I, I thought it either. meant was whatever. But um, some could argue it is. I just is that is that scotch? It's you know it's actually fake bourbon. <laughs> is it really okay? Yeah, it's called American malt. It's made by liars in England, so it tastes like bourbon, but it's just with it's just refreshing this way. I was gonna say. <laughs> no, no, Mister Mister Kinsella at eleven a.m. No, but it, it is a, Friday though. It is Friday, but uh. Actually, I'm I'm gonna I'm probably gonna look like I have a hangover because I stayed up till I started writing a blog post at eleven last night. Oh nice. I thought it would take me or a little article I thought it would take me thirty minutes and I, I at five forty five this morning I finished and I'm like fuck. Wow. So I decided to take a two hour walk and then I came home and crashed. So like I'm <laughs> that is worse than me because I've the latest latest I've stayed up on Clubhouse is five AM. So you beat me by forty five minutes. So congrats, sir. Well, I was writing an article, so I have a concrete, tangible result at least. So yeah, it wasn't yeah. wasn't just wasting. I love Clubhouse, but it's it's become it becomes addictive and waste waste of time. Some a suck of time. It does it does? Oh, you're you're a piped back of guy. Very mm -hmm. cool. It's called a church warden. A church. Oh yeah. That's why people I, uh, people can hear my dogs barking a lot because I sit out here on my balcony. Nice. Let me show, let me show the world. Yeah, I, I just call them Gandalf pipes because th that's what I think of. Well, the, it's it, called it, a church it's fun eye candy. It's called that because uh, if you re if you're like a scholar reading a big book, this goes behind the book sort of, so that it doesn't interfere with your studying a book or something. I'm, oh, I love it. Yeah, I'm on it. I'm on my balcony right now, so just it's a pretty day. I'm going to enjoy it. Oh man, look at that! And there's Louis Louis von Mises Kinsella, my poodle. <laughs> and my my other two. Anyway, wow, that is quite the poodle name. Mm -hmm. it's, it's fancy enough, but it's mm -hmm. humble at the same time. Well, my wife calls him King Louis, but I call him Louis von Mises, and that's on his uh, that's on his tag. So, <laughs> very great, very great. Uh, and so you're in Houston, right? Yeah, yeah, and I, I think we had first met in Houston. When I was helping out with the Monopoly on Violence documentary. Mm. Oh, that's Chris right. And, yeah, Chris and I hunted you down and we were going to speak Chris with Kofer, Ron right? Paul. Yeah. Did we go to my, my club, the Briar Club or something? Yes, we did. I remember. Yeah. It was I just saw I just saw Pete at Mises in Auburn about a week ago. Oh, cool. Yeah, I haven't kept up with him in in a hot minute. I think I think I messaged him Merry Christmas or something, but that was that was it. I I've been uh kind of abandoning my my liver pods as of late. It's just been everything or what? Bitcoin. Oh, Bitcoin. Okay. Yeah. But I mean, you know, I guess we, we can talk about this later, but it's funny. I was actually in your neck of the woods last night as well because I went to the uh, Houston Bitcoin meetup, which was the first one. But, oh, damn. Uh, I would have gone. I would have gone. Is there a, like a page or something? I think they're setting that up. Like it was the first one, but they're going to do this on a monthly basis. And we also do them uh, in Austin. In fact, the one in Austin in, in April is going to be uh, insane. Like you'll have American HODL and a bunch of like all your favorite Twitter people. Uh, come to the BitDevs meetup at Unchained Capital because um, a lot is going on that weekend because Ray Dalio is giving a speech at a and and there's just it's, it's just gonna be fun so uh, if you're not busy that weekend you should make it out but if you are then uh, I think uh, Mike Kin and I will also be in Houston for that meetup um yeah, I was actually hanging out with Anthony Semeroff, who's a Scottish libertarian. He does a Scottish yes. libertarian podcast. Yeah, yeah, we were stuff. we were out last night. We're, we're actually going skiing this weekend. We're going we're, tomorrow. We're going to Telluride uh, skiing. Well, we're going to go to Denver and hang out a day in Denver and meet meet libertarians in Denver. Then then 
and then Sunday we're going to tell you ride skiing. I love it. I've been snowboarding like over 10 years, I think. And I was going to go on a trip with some Bitcoiners, but I wanted to uh, save sats. I still haven't bought my flight tickets to uh, Bitcoin Miami, nor have I paid for like the living situation with that and BitBlock boom. So I don't know. I already have a busy year as it is. But anyway, we can probably cut the shit now and talk about substantial stuff but um yeah you've been you've been making the rounds as they say cringe i can't believe i just said that but uh i I enjoyed your conversation with alex vetsky as of recent and i wanted to cover some of the some similar topics but before all that just like it's it's very refreshing to you know find someone my my parents age and or older younger kind of give or take but to be like not only into Bitcoin, but like libertarianism. So I'm just, I'd like to know how you came to find yourself there. And, and then ultimately how you stumbled into your profession. Like why was intellectual property, like patent law, your calling? Mm. Like, That's interesting. Um, yeah. Uh, I probably should not have been a patent lawyer. <laughs> I mean, I'm good at it, and I've made money at it. Um, I don't really hate it. it. It came to be drudge work at a certain point, uh, so I, I diversified and changed what I, I changed it up. But because I started hating the system, it's a little bit weird to do it. Although you still need people like me to do it. Sorry, um, I, ju- ju- I just want to make sure we are recording. Yep. Okay. Cool. Yep. And so. Google. I was a I was I'm from Louisiana, rural Louisiana, and I was always sort of from the south. Uh, I mean, from from the from the country, so I kind of didn't fit in. You know, I was like uh, the, the bookworm kind of kid. So I went to private Catholic schools across parish lines because I just didn't go to the public schools near where I was. And so I didn't. It was weird. Like I I was kind of I didn't realize till later, but I was a little bit alienated because. When I went to school, I, I had to leave right away and had a long commute for like 12, 12 years. So I wasn't really part of the community at school, but I didn't know all the kids near my home because I didn't go to school with them. So, I, And plus I was adopted, and so I think that made me sort of ripe for Rand when I started reading her like in high school. Someone told me to read it. A librarian told me to read it at a Catholic high school. And Was she adopted? No, but she she knew I was kind of bookish, and so she told me to read Rand. No, I mean Ayn Rand. Was Ayn Rand adopted? No, but she adopted her name. (laughs) She changed (laughs) her name like I did. (laughs) My first name was Farrell Wayne Duaron, a a Cajun name. But anyway. That's um, badass. Yeah, my birth birth brother tracked me down when I was living in Philadelphia. When I was 30 years old, she finally tracked me down, and – she told me she was going to give up trying to find me when I turned 30. So she finally found me when I was a month away from my birthday. And um, she told me she gave me a weird name on purpose because she was having doubts when she gave me up for adoption. She thought giving me a weird name might help her find me easier. Of course, it didn't <laughs> because my name was changed right away by my my, my legal parents. So um, – but anyway um, – but I think that because I was sort of – I was smart and sort of – had to do everything on my own and I was came I didn't come from money so I was sort of like you know self-made kid whatever and I didn't like have this heritage bullshit a lot of people do you know oh I'm I'm Irish or I'm I'm Jewish or I'm you know Spanish roots and all this crap I think that I kind of Rand's individualism appealed to me in the fountainhead even though I hate the book now because now it just seems to me to be a, a story of this weird narcissist dude who quasi rapes is the woman and, and commits intellectual property terrorism by blowing up Cortland homes. So I think Atlas Shrugged is much better of a libertarian novel, but that Fountainhead is not. I'm not I don't know why it got me to be individualist. I guess because it's got this weird narcissistic individualist strain. But anyway, I became libertarian then because of that. And so I was interested in it, but I also wanted to get a real job. So I, I was practical and I like technology and computers. <laughs> so I studied electrical engineering in college, which I loved. And I was really good at it, but I felt like it wasn't enough for me because I was always arguing and writing, unlike engineers. And so I went to law school 
to argue and to learn the stuff Wait, you don't learn in engineering. Engineers are just like face down, like focused on the task, right? Like, how do you describe? Well, they're them? very pragmatic, so they don't get a lot of the PC bullshit, and um, that's good. And they 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 don't you know like I tested because I was I had good grades in high school and on the on the ACT I I tested out of all the all the liberal arts shit. Like I never even took a single English class, although I love that stuff, you know. Yeah. Um, so I never took any of this stuff, but I was – most engineers, a lot of them are not good at communication or, or writing and speaking. Um, so – but the ones that are can do well in law school because they're really – they're smarter than most lawyers. Engineering is harder. See what I mean about the dog? <laughs> that was uh, good. Yeah. So when a dog walks by, they start barking. Anyway. Um, this is a little long winded, but you asked. But that so I I went to I went to law school because I thought I could make more money and I wanted to stay in school longer. It was kind of a recession, and I I just I liked learning the the kind of um, the verbal mode of reasoning, and I liked economics and I liked uh, political reasoning, which you just didn't get any of philosophy, political philosophy, history, economics. You don't get any of that in engineering, and so I kind of liked that. Yeah. And I but because I could write and speak well, unlike most engineers. I, because like the chancellor of the law school tried to dissuade me from going. He said, You can go to law school with an engineering degree, but they have a tough time, which I, I found out was bullshit because I, I did better than almost everyone in law school because yeah. law school is law school is analytical, it's problem solving, just like engineering. It's just it's verbal instead of instead of mathematical. Um, so as long as you can communicate. So when I got out, I started doing oil and gas law, which was uh because I needed to get a job, and I moved to Houston because Louisiana is like a, 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 you know, it's like a barren wasteland. Um, so I got the hell out of Louisiana, which you know, is, I'm glad to be from Louisiana, but not living there. You know what I mean? Um, and oil and gas law, I, it didn't even occur to me to do patent law. Now it's natural. If you have a technology to undergrad, everyone says do patent law because only patent, only technology, only engineers can be patent lawyers, basically. I didn't realize that at the time, so I switched to double E so I could move to Philly with my wife. And, and I mean, and that, it, that, that, that's just to like legally protect the technological creation, right? Like, is that where that connection is? Well, the connection is that so to practice law, you have to pass the bar in a given state. So I passed I passed the bar in Texas and Louisiana because I was doing. Louisiana and Texas oil and gas law in Houston. That's why they recruited me. They recruit people from LSU because we know Louisiana law, which is a different legal system because it's civil law. All the other states are common law. So Louisiana is, is actually in demand in some states that need Louisiana civil law. So I was recruited in Houston to do oil and gas law. So I needed to know Louisiana and Texas law. So I took both bars. And then when I moved to Philadelphia, I took the Pennsylvania bar. But to do patent law, you have to pass the patent bar, but to take the patent bar, you have to have a technical degree. And the reason is you, you to do patents, you have to understand technology. You have to talk to engineers and understand their inventions, yeah. and most lawyers can't do that because they're they're either dumbasses or they don't have any technical. That's that's one reason a lot of people major in English or history or they go to law schools because they're bad at math. You know what I mean? <laughs> that's why they that do it. That would have been me. Exactly. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. It's true. Um, so the the, the the small percent of lawyers, like probably probably three percent, five percent, that are engineers, they're the ones who can do patent law if they want to. Yeah. Um, although it bores a lot of even them. So it's kind of a we have a natural supply cap on how many people can be or want to be patent lawyers. Um, so I did that, and I was really good at it, and I liked it. But the whole time I was developing my my libertarian theories, and I was at roughly the same time I passed the patent bar in 1994. I, I came to the conclusion as a libertarian that the this patent and the copyright system is total bullshit. You know, <laughs> um, and I was afraid to say it out loud too much because I thought it would hurt my career. Like you have this young associate at a big law firm representing big clients. Like I, I represented Intel. I did work for Intel and. UPS and General Electric, you know, companies like that. Uh, wow. I thought that they would find out about it, and you know, it's sort of like these libertarians that think they're a threat to the state, and like they think the FBI has a file on them because they think they're important. <laughs> no one gives a shit what you believe. My clients didn't oh, care. Unless if you successfully move a lot of money, I heard uh, someone 
I I think it was like free radio or something in New Hampshire. They finally got caught because they were moving just like ten million dollars or something. So, yeah, but then they don't care what your views are. It's just you're you're breaking yeah. their laws. Um, yeah, yeah, good point. So I did patent law, and I'm I'm st- I still do it. I'm kind of semi retired now. I work just a few hours a week, um, and uh, it's been good for my career. Although I kind of wish I had I studied international law in London for a master's degree after law school. And I really like that. I've written some books on it, but I never, I did a little bit of it when I did oil and gas law, but then I switched to patents and the international stuff kind of went away. That would have been a good career too. Um, and so, so would have been probably something like tax law because um, that's really creative and you could help companies a- a- avoid taxes legally. Um, and um, uh, maybe corporate law would have been a good field to go into like and mergers and acquisitions and securities and oil yeah. and gas law would have, would have been good to stay in because that field fell apart in the 90s but it came back in the 2000s and there was a shortage of oil and gas lawyers because everyone had left so i maybe should have stayed in that because i really liked it um but patent law worked out for me made me mobile the good thing about it was it's a national field because it's federal law it's patent and copyright or federal law so it doesn't really matter what state you're licensed in or where you're from yeah. no one cares so i could I, and i wanted to move to philly so that allowed me to break into the Philly market, which is really hard because up up north, those Yankees are really uh, – they're, they're kind of assholes compared to the south. Like you come to Houston, <laughs> no one gives a fuck where you're from. You know what I mean? Yeah. Everyone's from somewhere else here. You go to Philly, and it's like they're cold and standoffish, and it's hard to break into the scene because you, your parents didn't come on the fucking Mayflower and you know all that shit. <laughs> uh, you know. And so – but if you're a patent lawyer, you know – they they needed an electrical engineer patent attorney of a certain years of experience, and that's what I fit. So they didn't care what law school I went to. They didn't care where I was from. They didn't care about my grades, anything. They just wanted that. So it made me uh, geographically mobile. So that's kind of my story of where I ended up. And um, um, and in the and the, and the and the whole time I was developing this sort of uh, this avocation or this hobby of libertarian theory and writing because I enjoyed it, and I enjoyed gradually developing, uh, kind of coming up with insights on different areas when I saw a need to elaborate or to develop theory in certain areas like property theory and rights theory and contract theory and causation and responsibility and punishment theory and intellectual property. And I kind of get sick of talking about IP, but not really because like my favorite stuff that I've that I work on is, is really like epistemology and methodology and economics and law and rights and basics of libertarian theory. But having to do IP – and everyone asks me for that because I'm like – I'm one of the rare ones who understands IP law and deep libertarian theory. Like I'm probably the only one, <laughs> and, um, and uh, because almost every patent lawyer is either anti-intellectual or they're a statist. You know? So like I know, th- I know personally… Maybe one patent lawyer who agrees with me, but he keeps it private. That's it. And there's two or three others that are kind of anti-IP, but they're not not really for the right reasons. You know, they're kind of lefties. So that's about it. And they don't even practice it. You know, they're just like some law professor who who got the patent bar, but he never did it. Um, <laughs> and 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 then most most libertarians are not patent attorneys, of course. So um, so I have a unique niche, but. But doing it has forced me to clarify thinking about property, which has really improved my understanding and ability to understand under, – to explain the basic – the bases of libertarian uh, property theory and even some economic things like Mises, uh, linking Mises praxeology into, into uh, libertarian and, and legal, uh, legal philosophy or political philosophy. And um, yeah. So – and so people say don't – like I've probably given 150 or 300 speeches or interviews on IP, and someone yesterday said – like Anthony Samaroff said, do you get tired of it? It's like you know, l- let's say suppose you're a professor at a college and you teach economics 101. You know, you got to give the same lecture every year. I don't know if you get tired of it. It's, just, it's like if a juggler juggles every night for a living. You know, It's just – I don't mind teaching something that I know. I don't get bored of it at all. I mean… So no, I guess the answer is no. I, I sometimes wonder why people want to interview me on their podcast for exactly the same thing I said in the same way two weeks ago when they could just replay that episode, but I guess they want it on their show. So 
I don't care. We'll reach into audience. Guilty. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I don't care. I always say yes to anything. Yeah. No, it's amazing that you're able to just find niches just in the, the perfect niche way, like mechanical engineering and uh, law and then, you know, property law and IP and just libertarianism it's uh it's really funny how people just kind of like find their fold in life and they're like well shit uh i well, just made so, a market so, for myself and so patent law so what's interesting about patent law i have like a love hate thing with it because it always been good to me but um and by the way libertarians always ask me about the hypocrisy thing and that's a complicated thing i have to go into boring aspects of what the practice is like which they don't understand but i have always steered my career in a way that what I do, I believe, is innocuous or or good. Like, I've always refused to represent the the client that's using patents in an aggressive way. I've I've represented clients who have defended themselves from a patent lawsuit, sometimes by countersuing with the patent. But I I regard that as self defense, so that's not illegitimate. And I also help clients obtain patents, which is analogous to selling guns or bullets to someone. Um, which they can use for good or for evil, right? And so I, I sell bullets to people, and quite often they just stockpile them to use defensively. But if they turn around and use them offensively, it's kind of not my decision, and I don't help them do that. So I've tried to keep yeah. my hands clean ethically, um, although in an I mean, ideal world, my, my career would be abolished. Um, you right. know, there would be no, no patent lawyers, and I would be happy with that. Um, but um, well, what I, I mean, was going to say – go ahead. Oh, no, I, I was just going to say, like, you have to use the current constructs that you're forced to by the state, but you have to find the loopholes to use it against, Correct. Uh, you know, coercion and evil or like what, well, whatever. Yeah, like it, not the just government. evil, but like you need to use them at your advantage to protect people and their property, you know? Yeah, Even if, if you disagree st- with, with the constructs, yeah, you have to take the advantage of where you can. It, yeah, the state's threatening to prosecute you and jail you for for smoking or for using cocaine. Then you need to hire a defense attorney. And in a free war, in a free world, that defense attorney wouldn't have that 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 job wouldn't exist. So he's a waste on society because of the law. But given that the law exists, you need him, um, and he does something good. He helps defend people from the state, although he his living depends upon the state's evil laws existing. Right, so. It's same thing with, a, with an oncologist. You know, he's he's fighting cancer. If he if he succeeds, if he had his wishes, cancer would be abolished. He would be out of a job. But <laughs> that's just the way of the world sometimes. But what I was going to say is, like, this country is so large and spe- and rich and highly technical that patent law. I don't know. There's fifty, sixty thousand patent lawyers in the country. They are so hyper specialized, which shows the division of labor. So that I've specialized not only in electrical engineering stuff like computer software and heart and computer hardware, but I've subspecialized within that. I I only do laser patents, like patents on late on fiber optic semiconductor laser technology. That's it. Rad. That's such a narrow, narrow niche. There may be, I don't know, there may be 10 attorneys in the country who can do that, you know, because they understand the physics and the law and the practice and the business and the tech and, and the way to talk to engineers and physicists and PhDs. Um, so it's like a miracle that we're such a rich society that we have such a specialization and division of labor, but it's in a field that shouldn't exist. So it's like sad at the same time. Like it's such a waste, like all these salaries oh going gosh. to people like me, you know, it's horrible. Yeah. I mean, it's like, it's the same thing with Uber, right? Or like one of those unicorn companies that probably shouldn't exist because of like the fiat money and just how easy it is to get like cheap credit. But then if you have something like Uber, whether or not it comes from funny money like that, it disrupts like a legacy model of like the taxi system. And it just is a net good. And then you have competition that comes out of it, like with Lyft or whatever. And you just have this abundance that pleases the market. And it turns out to be like a net good. But then it's like, again, would that happen without fiat money? Well, I kind of wonder if, if Bitcoin would happen without fiat money. I think eventually it would, but it might not have oh, happened. Oh, like we need it with like inflation and everything. Um, it, it's like fiat money definitely helps, but because Bitcoin is already here, it is like the medium. It's like the vessel for absorbing real value 
because people are going to look at the bond market or, or equities or whatever, and people are just going to lose faith in it. And like we're starting to see that because the you know 10 year treasury yield curve went up like a 250 bips or whatever the hell it was. And it's just signals like these markets are, are, are fake, like they're bunk. And like we need that inflation because if that inflation isn't going to go into these vehicles, they're eventually going to go into Bitcoin because that, like that's what people are going to, to trust. Like you can't really debate like digital finite scarcity. I, 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 I imagine that if we had had a 100% reserve gold standard in the world all these years, then the argument for Bitcoin would be radically diminished. Like it would, it would be a slight improvement, but it wouldn't be a radical improvement, right? Yeah. Because it's solving a lot of problems that a 100% gold reserve standard would also solve. Uh, it would basically just be cheaper to transport and easier to store. I mean, but it wouldn't have many other advantages uh, over gold. Well, I, I mean, guess it would you, be, not everyone it, in the world, no matter where they are in, in the world, would be able to verify the supply of gold correct. in their yeah. living room though yeah i guess it's got this several so advantages. radical about it. it it would eventually i think it would eventually emerge but it might not emerge for another 15 years you know instead of instead of in 2009 yeah man okay so back to the like the, the patent lasers and everything like when you do what you do what does that really entail okay uh, so patent law Patent law, well, intellectual property is the broad term, right? Intellectual property is, is a type of law that cover that includes, it's like we call it an umbrella term. It covers copyrights, patents, trademarks, trade secrets, and other things like entertainment law and licensing and, and those kind of negotiations. But patent law itself is kind of divided into two types. One is IP litiga or patent litigation, and one is patent prosecution. Patent litigation, you actually don't have to be a patent attorney. You could just be any attorney, and they, they're the ones who go to court, and they enforce or defend people. They enforce patents like they sue people for patent infringement, or they defend people who are being sued for patents, um, and I've played a role in that like support on those teams because they usually need registered patent attorneys to help them because the litigators… If they're not patent lawyers themselves, they don't quite understand the technology and the patents as well as we do, so we cooperate with them. Um, and that can be very lucrative, but it's like it's like plaintiff's law. It, it can be hit or miss. You can make a lot or you can make a little. You know. Uh, and then there's prosecution, which is the which is what I do, which is you. And prosecution is a weird word. It doesn't mean like the state prosecuting for a crime. It's a word we use to mean uh, the process of working with the patent office to get a patent. Um, so it means I, I get hired by a company to talk to their engineers who think they've come up with some new invention, and I, I get them to explain it to me, and that takes work to understand how to speak engineer language because they don't yeah. usually know how to they – don't, they don't know how to talk to lawyers, and they, they don't just, know how to talk – they don't know how to answer the right questions, so you get good at – because we're engineers too, they trust us more than regular lawyers. They don't hate us like they yeah. hate regular lawyers. See, uh, I feel like I have to, like I'm, I'm roommates with Ben, the car man who works on, uh, uh, Bitcoin Scala, or just like an in, in, in implementation of like Bitcoin code, and does like, uh, DLCs, in, which I think you might be interested in because it's like permissionless, uh, betting or so whatever. But it's like, I feel like I'm in that same position because. I am trying to abstract all of the Cody language so like any retard off the street can like understand it. So it's kind of like you're just trying to uh, just just like sift out like what it is yeah. that their their technology actually does so that the average Joe can know what the hell they're talking about. Yeah, it's so sort of like writing a technical report. There's a certain skill you have to communicate it, but you have to know the technology, but you have to simplify it enough for the reader to understand it. Um, so the process is almost cookie cutter and the same, and so some people get bored by it, but every invention is unique. So if you're like me and you have a certain kind of nerd mind, you find it interesting because every invention is a new challenge, but you get the process down so that you get efficient at it. So you might be able to do a patent in 10, 15, 20 hours, which takes someone else 40 or 50 hours. And you usually charge a flat fee, so you can make a pretty good hourly rate in effect, you know, hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of dollars per hour. Um, 
so the process is you meet with the engineer you ask him questions he doesn't want to answer like you'll say he'll say oh i got, I got this new chip uh, this new semiconductor design and it's on a silicon chip and it's designed this way and the capacitance is this and all this and then when you write the patent you want it to be as broad as possible so that it covers people that come up with alternate designs to get around it so i'll yeah. say something like i'll say well could could you use a different substrate and, and instead of answering the question which is exactly what i said could you use another substrate he will say no you wouldn't want to do that so i'll say could you use gallium arsenide he'll say no you wouldn't want to do that i said i didn't ask you if you'd want to i said <laughs> yeah. could you and and he'll say uh yeah you could but it would be more expensive i said Patent law is not about expensive. I'm talking I about hate it. Like these people cannot just give a yes or no answer because they know too much about what they're already doing. Yeah, they, they're focused on the way they're going to build it, and that's all they think about. And I'm like, I like to, I like you to give me a narrow example of a working model. That's fine, but I want to broaden it to cover possible ways you could change it. And you got to think outside the box, and you got to forget about practicality for a second. So I've gotten good at doing that. So. But you have to push them out of their comfort zone to answer the fucking question, you know? Wait, wait. Uh, so you need to broaden what it is that they create? Because that seems counterproductive in protecting what they create. No, you're so making it's, it's, it open it, for like the rest of the market. No, it's very arcane. So a typical patent. So, so I'll explain in a second. So, the, so they explain the invention to you. I get an idea. And by the end of the conversation, they think you're they think I'm a dumbass because I'm asking all these elementary questions. <laughs> but but when I send them a draft a week later, they read it and they go, God damn, you were listening. You know, they and I was like, Yeah, the reason I was asking the stupid questions was to it's a way to get information from you and to educate me. And anyway, um, so I write the description. The patent has a description of, of the invention. The patent is basically what we call a patent bargain. The government says we will give you a monopoly on this claimed invention if you disclose in writing to the world what it is. So the trade is not – it's not they're not trying to encourage innovation. They're trying to encourage disclosure. So they're trying to say instead of keeping your invention secret as a trade secret, we want you to reveal to the world your ideas that they can't use for 17 years, but at least they can read it and learn about it. And you know, the whole thing is ridiculous. Like that's they're the forced idea. to open source it. In a way, correct. You you have to reveal it to the world. You have to you have to reveal it in writing. You have to reveal a working model. It's you have to enable someone to do it, and you have to give the best mode. Like if you have three ways of doing it, and you think one's the best, you have you can't hide the best way. You have to reveal the best mode. You don't have to say which one it is. You can you can disclose all three all three embodiments, but you you have to disclose the best one in your mind. Or, and if you fail to do any of those things, the patent can be invalidated later on. But anyway, so wow. I write the patent, and then I they, I get them to approve it, and I file it. And then the, the, an examiner at the patent office does a search of trying to find similar things in the prior art, and then he, he sends me back a report saying, um, I think it's fine. I'm going to allow it, which is rare on the first go. Or he'll say it's got these problems, these semantic problems or these or – these, uh, or I found some some previous inventions which are too similar, and he'll reject it. And sometimes you have to abandon it and give up, in which case the company just wasted fifteen thousand dollars. And they know they can do that sometimes. It's a numbers game. So like fifteen percent of their patents, they're gonna waste. They're gonna they're gonna go abandoned. One reason I hate representing independent inventors because they only have one or two inventions, and everyone is like their baby. And if you if you don't get it issued, they think you failed, and they they hate you. So I, I never represent independent inventors because they're not big boys. They don't wear big boy panties. I represent big corporations that know it's a numbers game, and I deal with professional in-house counsel, and I call them up and I say, okay, I got the first nine, but this tenth one is not going to go through. We should, we should bail it here instead of wasting more money on it. And they say, fine, drop it. So that's what I like to do. But anyway, that's called prosecution. So I go back and forth to the patent office. It takes about two years usually, and then finally a patent issues, and now it's an enforceable document. Now… In the patent, you have the description, and you have drawings that illustrate it, and you have a set of things called claims. They're numbered from 1 to like 20 or whatever, and the claims are always a sentence which says what is claimed is, colon, and then number one. It says uh, I claim, number one, uh, an apparatus comprising the following elements, A, B, C, and D. 
So <laughs> the reason I asked them to broaden it is because it's like peeling an onion. The first claim is broad and the second is narrow. And everyone gets confused about this because it's arcane, but it's the opposite of what you think. So if, if a claim is broad, that means it covers – like let's say you have a uh, – let's say you, you, you invent a stool. No one, ha no one knows how to sit down, right? They sit down on the ground, and someone comes up with a stool, which I would define as um, an, uh, 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 a seating device comprising a substantially horizontal seat member physically <laughs> connected to at least three leg members. That's how you would describe it, of substantially equal length, something like that. So now you have a claim that defines… A, an object in the world that has these elements it has a, a, a seat and three legs. Okay. Now, if later someone invents a chair, which is a stool with a back and with four legs, let's say, that still is an infringement of my patent because a, a chair has a seat and it has three legs. You see? It still has three legs and it still has a seat. So the fact that it has a fourth leg and a, and a back doesn't mean. That it doesn't infringe my patent. Right. Now, they could get a patent on their chair because it has an, an improvement, and they could get a patent on an improved stool called a chair comprising a seat, a back member, and four legs. Just don't call it a stool. No, it doesn't matter what you call it, but they couldn't make it because it would still be a stool. So they couldn't make their right. chair, and, and I couldn't make a chair because it would infringe their patent. So what Got would it. happen so is… They would cross license to each other, usually. Yeah, but like the, but, the broadness just is what protects so, you. So the broadness is done because if I have a patent on, let's say someone invents a chair, and I claim it as a stool. Like I say, someone invents a chair, and I say, well, my first claim is going to be a, a seat platform with three legs. Okay. That would cover my chair, and it would cover anyone making a chair or a stool. But let's say later on someone fights my – like I sue someone making a stool. I'm sorry. I sue someone making a chair for violating my stool patent claim, and they in litigation, they defend themselves by finding prior art showing a stool. So the prior art would say there's a stool that was known already. So the patent office should not have granted my claim one on a stool because it was already known. So my second claim would be the, 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 the seating device of claim one further comprising a back. So claim two would be a chair. So you reason you have – you start with a broad claim and you go narrower and narrower by adding more elements is because in litigation, if your top claim gets struck out because if the broader it is… The more things it covers, but that also means the more prior art that reads on it. So the more likely it is to get struck down in litigation. So you want to have a set of onion onion skin type claims or rust, nested rushing dog type claims. Like yeah, the first funnel. one is, it's a funnel. And so like if so, I would accuse the guy selling the chair. I would accuse him of violating my claim one because it is a stool. But I, I would also accuse him of violating claim two, which is a chair. So if in litigation he finds prior art that shows a stool, he might get claim one struck down, but claim one, claim two would survive, and he would still be infringing claim two. So that's the reason if he tells me about a chair, I don't want to claim just a chair. I want to claim the stool because it might cover a stool, and it might not be prior art. So anyway, yeah. that's – and that's this what most people's eyes glaze over at, the stuff I just told you, which is very inside baseball, patent lawyer bullshit. No, it makes <laughs> sense. Like you, yeah. you lawyer your way around with the bullshit rhetoric to protect your ass so you have enough reasons to sue people if you want to protect your invention. Like it makes total sense. Like, But but everyone, everyone gets confused. Like um, they confuse what a patent right is and what prior art is. So – it's the opposite of copyright. So if you write a novel, you the copyright gives you the right to publish it because you are the author of that novel, and it gives you the right to stop people from copying it. But if someone else happened to write the exact same novel on their own, they would have an own their own independent copyright in their novel, but you would be able to publish yours because you wrote it. Now that never right. happens. Because, wait, wait, so we're distinguishing patents versus copyrights. So copyright is for artistic or original works. So right. 
they does give you the right to do it, unlike patents, but you never need the right to do it because no one ever comes up with the same novel. But in patents, people could come up with the same invention because usually inventions come when their time has come. Like yeah. you know, the light bulb, Edison wasn't the only guy doing the light bulb. The light bulb would have come up, would have come around eventually anyway. Like lots of inventions, it's just the first guy to come to the patent office. It's called the race to the patent office. He wins. But the point is, if you have a patent, like the stool example, like I like I give the example, some guy patents a stool and then some guy patents an improvement called a chair. The guy that patents the improvement. He can't make the chair because the patent doesn't give him the right to make the chair. It only gives him the right to exclude people, to stop people from making the chair. Okay. Wait, so wait, that's so the first thing. You can make an invention. No, no you can it, make the patent for the invention without making the actual invention. And yeah, in fact, in the original patent system, you had to make a working model and submit it to the patent office, but they abolished that decades ago. So now all you have to do is write it down. So their only requirement is a written description. You just have to write it. You can. So that's why patent lawyers wow. like this. So this this in chain Craig Wright company, they have fifteen hundred patents pending on blockchain type technology. I know what they do. They sit around a boardroom. They sit around a conference table with a, a bunch of engineers, and they just spitball. They go, okay. There might be something they're working on. There might be something they're brainstorming. Or they just might they might just have a conversation and say, uh, hey, you know what we could do? You could have uh you could carry over the the, the checksum zero on the register, and that that might be a, a more efficient way to uh, calculate the uh the hash thing. And they'll say, Yeah, that sounds good. And the patent lawyer's in the corner with a with a dictaphone recording it. And he goes home and writes he writes up a paragraph and he sends it to them. They go, That sounds good. And then he just writes it up into a document and they file Send it. it. <laughs> It's, it's called constructive reduction to practice. So instead of reducing it to practice, which means making a working model, the day that you file the patent application is called a constructive reduction to practice. Now, the patent office has the – they maintain – they reserve the right to demand that you submit a working model if they want to, like if they don't think it works, like it, it's a perpetual motion machine or something. But I've never – they've never done that to me in the hundreds of patents I've done. They never do that anymore. Um, so – all you have to do is come up with ideas and write them down on paper, and that's an invention. Um, and you never have to make oh. it. You never have to practice it. You never have to prove that it works. Uh, but once you get it issued, the language is murky, and you can you can threaten to sue people, and they don't know what it means. And so they pay you a license fee of $100,000 rather than spend half a million to defend it and maybe even lose in court. You know what I mean? So it's just an extor the whole thing's a, the whole thing's a complete extortion racket. Um, but are you on both sides of that? No, like I said, I've, I have never, I have never represented someone using their patents aggressively. I okay. have. It was in the beginning. It was by luck. Like I was at law firms, and they would say, "We need you to help on this case," and I would help on the case. And it was a patent lawsuit, and it was I was always the defendant, so I always felt morally okay about it. And later mm -hmm. on, I started having more choice, and I always just turned down the. I said, "No, I'm not going. I'm not going to help someone uh, use a patent to bully someone. I just refuse but I, to." But like. What would the process be if I just had one of these like mental masturbations of an idea that I wanted to patent? Like, what would that process be? Would I just like race to my local patent office, or like would I need a lawyer like you to like look at it, verify it, and get it approved? And then you don't need to send race to the office, and then I get my hundred grand. You don't need to no. Okay, so you don't need to race because it's rare that someone's doing the same thing. So you can take your time usually. Uh, there are two ways you could do it. You could do it yourself, or you could pay someone. So the three, like the three main types of IP, is is like copyright, trademark, and patent. Copyright is automatic, so you don't need a lawyer. And if you want to register it, which is optional, you just send it to the copyright office. You can do it for seventy-five bucks or twenty bucks. I forgot the fee. So anyone can do that on their own. You don't need a lawyer for that. Trademarks are a little bit more difficult. Some people do it on their own. You usually hire a lawyer, but it's not that expensive, like a grand or two. What, what's um, the difference with trademarks and copyright? Copyright covers artistic creations okay. like, like like paintings, movies, song. music, novels, okay. poems, so, and, and also software code because that's a writing. Um, but yeah. it's called original, original works, a creative work that you can write down on some medium so you can store it somewhere. Like right. singing a song is not a copyright because it's just… It's an action that disappears when you're done. But if you record it, the recording is a copyright. Or if you write down a novel, like if you have an idea of a novel in your head, there's no copyright. But you have to. But as soon as you write it down, you have a copyright automatically. Right. Trademark, you have to file. 
well, you have a trademark by common law as soon as you start using a, a mark in commerce. Like if you start selling a product with a name or if you have a name on your business, you have a common law trademark, but that's that's precarious because there's a federal system. So it's better to file a registration. Common and, law is is like you said, like it's commerce based law, right? No, common law was they're all commerce based, but common law was what arose in the common law. So it was uh, it was so that means it's state based. Every state has their own trademark system, but. In, in the 50s, the federal government enacted the Lanham Act, and they, they preempted the field mostly. See, it's a little – so this is where constitutional law and, and legality come into it. This is US-centric, of course, which I hate, but that's the system I know and the one that dominates the world. So the Constitution has a copyright clause, which says Congress has the power to enact copyright and patent law. Copyright protects artistic works. Patent protects inventions. But it didn't say Congress could could regulate trademarks, which was a state law field, state law common mm. law. So what they did was they finally passed a patent act called the Lanham Act in the 50s, and they used the interstate commerce clause, which was not meant to be a grant of power, but the, court, the, the federal government has used it as a grant of power. So what they said was if there's any kind of commerce that, that crosses state lines… Then the federal trademark law applies, and of course now the world is so interconnected and there's the internet, so almost everything is interstate. So, um, so you still have state trademark systems which are common law, and they have their own statutes. So you can register a mark in Texas, and you can register it federally, but most people just do federally. So to register a trademark federally, which is the name of a product or the name of a company, um, it's called a mark. You know, like like Coca Cola. Yeah. Um, you could do that on your own, although most people would hire a lawyer because they just know what they're doing. And then patents are the hardest of all, and if you get good at it, if you're a smart engineer, you can do your own. You can read a book called Patent It Yourself or Do It Yourself. There's a couple of companies that publish those books, and if you read them, you can figure it out. It's not rocket science. Uh, well, actually, it is rocket science in some cases, but <laughs> there are some rocket scientists out there. But um, So what you do is… If you wanted to do it on the cheap, you would you would write like a technical document, like three, four, five, ten, twenty page technical document, like a report describing your invention. Or a white paper. And like a white paper, but you would preferably have some some drawings in it which illustrate it. And you would have at least one claim. And the claim can be half-assed as long as it's a claim, like number one, a method or an apparatus having the following elements or steps period you know and then you could file that for only like 75 dollars i think as a what's called a provisional patent and then within one year you could file a regular patent based on it so wh what some people do is if they don't have a lot of money they just file their own provisional patent they just do it themselves so they spend a hundred dollars you know um the problem is usually they miss something and it's half-assed and shoddy and then within a year did they start approaching Companies to maybe license it or build it, or they test the market then. And if they think their product might work or someone might want to buy it, they might just sell the provisional patent to like a big company and they walk away with the royalties. That's rare, but you can do that. And then they take it over and then they hire a patent lawyer to finish it up and do a regular patent. But you have one year before it expires. So the better way would be to file a regular patent from the start. And that costs, if you hire a lawyer, it would cost, let's say, between eight and twenty thousand dollars depending upon the quality of the lawyer or the law firm and how complicated your invention is and there's no guarantee you'll get a patent but you probably will get something in about in about two or three years so the patent law the patent law until about 2011 under obama it was changed the u.s system used to be a first to invent system Everyone, every other country in the world has a first to file. Um, the U.S. had a first to invent, which meant if two people file patents on the same rough idea, you would have what's called an interference proceeding at the patent office where you would determine which one would get – because only one person could get a patent on the same idea. They both have to be independent inventors, but they both could have independently invented it. But then the question is which one gets the patent, and… It used to be – it wasn't the guy who filed first. It was the guy who invented it first. So if I file first, but the other guy filed three months later, 
but he could prove by his lab notebooks that he had invented it or conceived of it two years before, and I only conceived of it a year before, he would win. Now, that was changed in 2011, I believe it was, with the America Invents Act under Obama, and we, we, we went to the system the rest of the world uses, which is the first to file. So now whoever files first gets it if there's a conflict. Um, so interference proceedings have been abolished now, so it's just whoever files first wins. Um, and this, under that old system, your patent would last for 20 years from the date you filed it. So you file it on day one. It would take about three years to get it issued, and then you'd have about 17 years left of your term. But under the new system, it's just – it's just. wait, I'm sorry. I have it backwards. It used to be 17 years from the date of issuance no matter what. So you'd file it. Three years later, you'd issue. You'd have 17 years. Now the current system is – it's 20 years from the date of filing. So if you get it issued in one year, you have 19 years of term left. If it takes you five years to prosecute it, you have 15 years left. Unless it's a pharmaceutical and the FDA is the reason that it delays you being able to put your product on the market so you can add on to your patent term a certain number of years due to the federal Drug administration's delays. So you have one right. federal agency that imposes costs on pharmaceutical companies and imposes delays and requires them to reveal their secrets while they're getting this approval process so that by the time they release their pharmaceutical on the market, number one, they've incurred tons of costs. Number two, it's taken them time. Number three, their patent is shorter. And number four, their competitors are ready to compete. And so they complain that they need a patent to protect them from competition. So the government has introduced this FDA system, which impedes the market, and then gives them a patent, which impedes the market, to make up for the cost they imposed on them in the first place. So the whole thing is a sick, twisted game of one federal – it's like Mises said, controls breed controls. So if you have one government intervention, it causes problems. The government's got to have another government intervention to fix that fucking problem. Yeah. You know. And so you have all these idiots who defend the patent system by saying, well, God, pharmaceutical companies, they, they, they have faced competition, and they, it's so easy to compete. They can't recoup their costs, and I'm like, well, their fucking costs are so high in the first place that they need to recoup because the FDA imposes it on them, and they face competition because the, the FDA makes them reveal their secrets while the, during the process. So instead of having the government, which causes this problem in the first place, solve the problem by having another system, the patent system, which causes its own problems, why don't you just get rid of the fucking FDA? <laughs> They're like, well, you don't want to have uh, you don't want to have drugs going out there that are not approved by the government. It's like, okay, well, you get what you fucking pay for, motherfucker. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like these people. <sighs> Speaking of drugs, you got the you got the Koof Vax, didn't you? I did. I'm getting the second one tomorrow. And and how I'm a bootlicker. I'm a wife licker, man. My wife said to get it. My doctor said to get it. So I didn't have to research it. It makes the decision easy. Oh, uh, I felt fine. I had a sore arm for three or four days. I had the I had the Moderna one. My son got the Pfizer this week. Yeah, I, look, right? I wasn't afraid. I wasn't afraid of COVID. But I'm not afraid of the vaccine either. That's my attitude. You know, you got to right. die of something. I agree. Where are you? I, are you getting it? You're too young to get it so far, right? I mean, your son is like almost 10 years younger than me. So, yeah, he, he got it somehow in Houston because he's Texas Children's Hospital. He's still 17. So he somehow got on a list. Yeah. I, if you stick that needle in my arm, I will fucking break your arm. But let's put it that way. <laughs> that that is a violation of my property. Oh, absolutely! I, I totally agree with that. Of course. I, but, and uh, like every, you, you probably different. don't need it to be honest. You know. No, I I don't. You're young and, and healthy. And that that that's like the point. It's just again creating these bullshit constructs, uh, whether or not like they're intended to protect you it's just like arbitrary and like a power grab and i'm also kind of weirded out that like you'll hear interesting edge cases of people getting it and 
they're sick for days or like they get Bell's palsy, like half their face paralyzes or something. Like, you know, the, like those are weird cases, but it's still not worth my time to like risk the unknown for something that isn't threatening me directly or at well, all. I, I'm afraid that like I'm traveling tomorrow. I've been traveling a lot the last few months and um, like a buddy of mine came from Ecuador to go with me skiing in February and he had to get the PCR test to come here and then he had to get one to go back home. Um, I'm just afraid like if I want to go to Europe next year or something or I'm going to Turkey in September, you know, I don't know. Maybe, I mean, if it's too much of a hassle, I might not go. If it's too risky, there, uh, hell, I might want to go there to sell some Bitcoin for a hundred thousand bucks. You know, um, <laughs> right? They're buying it for a hundred thousand now. Um, I mean, if it's in Turkey and it, and you're you're going in September, it might be like, like double that. It might be, but um, what I'm th- thinking is, you know, you might basically need to prove you're vaccinated to start traveling. And if that's the case, I mean, you know, I, I'm I've never been one of these cut your nose off to spite your face kind of guys. I'm not I'm not gonna. I'm not going to impede my lifestyle just to make a, a stand on principle. I, I'd rather just yeah pay the price and do what you need to do to, to, to live your life, you know? And I mean, I'd probably cave and do the same thing, but it's just like as libertarians of all people, it's just so anti-freedom. Like what we believe is like, you know, we can already say that the state's already, already won and we're doomed, but I think Bitcoin helps turn that around. But also when it comes to something like the, the vaccination and like you like that becomes your global passport, it's just so coercive. Yeah, I, I'm hoping that it's temporary, though. I hope this goes away and we get back to roughly normal. But they've established yeah. a precedent, which is dangerous. But so, I mean, have you ever taken the, the flu vaccine and other vaccines? Yeah. OK, so you're not an anti-vaxxer. So to me, when you take those, you're, you're trusting the medical establishment already. So, you know, if they say this is safe. Which and in itself is it already a problem, probably. It probably is, but I mean, yeah, I mean, so do you think COVID is real? Yeah, my my dad got it, but the thing well, is, they say, like, he, they say he got it, right? I mean, I don't. I mean, I assume. I mean, he, real, but... he he tested for it. He had all the symptoms, and but here's the the thing: what's really messed up about it is that because, like, what you were saying about the the Mises thing, like controls, you know, beget controls or whatever. It's because like there there needs to be more of an open like free market solution to this, and I feel like regulations make everything worse and they go into shock and decisions are just made more irresponsibly, and because we're burdened by all these decisions of like whether or not to wear a mask or or not or anything that might negatively just affect the entire process because of some arbitrary rule that like the experts at the CDC made that it that impedes on actually figuring out what the root of the problem is um and so like what happened with my dad is that he got covid but then a- after he got covid he basically got like pneumonia because when he was a kid back 40 some odd years ago whatever he got pneumonia and so that carried over throughout his life to where, you know, he was in like a COVID unit and then had to go home with an oxygen tank and he almost fucking died. And so it's just because there's so many controls, it's it it prevents decisions to be made and just like innovation. And there's just a bunch of like limbo. I don't really know yeah. what's going on. Yeah, I think that's reasonable. I mean, look, my view is I think there probably is COVID. I think it's probably worse than the flu. I really don't know. I hear libertarians have all their opinions, but they're not fucking epidemiologists, but they, they play one on TV. Um, you know, they keep telling us not to trust the medical establishment, but I don't, I don't, I don't really know if I trust them either. You know, they, they have all these yeah. opinions and, you know, they're giving out opinions that is basically advice to other people as to what to do with their bodies, which is, you know, I wouldn't be so cavalier and cocksure about this. I, I don't give people advice about this. I don't pretend to be an expert. I think it's a little bit irresponsible to run around doing that. Now, they say it's irresponsible for the, for the medical profession and the government to be doing it, and maybe they're right, but I don't, I don't really trust – I don't go to fucking libertarians for my medical advice. I'll tell you that. <laughs> I mean libertarians have enough problems. Uh, 
you know, I, I tolerate my people because that's what you got to get to talk to people that have half a brain on politics, but they're not always the most reliable neighbors, if you know what I mean. Um, um, I, so I suspect that there's something to it. Uh, I suspect that there is a vaccine that does something. I also suspect that the tests that detect COVID and they detect the antibodies are probably <laughs> way more flawed than they admit. Yeah, like lots of false positives, lots of false negatives, and they and probably the vaccine is less effective than they say. But if they just have to pretend like it worked because they put so much in it, and then that lets them say that the threat's over, let's go back to normal. That's fine with me. Um, to be honest, my first my first opinion on this was a little bit Darwinian. Like my view was like, listen, the reason we are a successful species and race is because evolution has occasionally weeded out you know it's called the herd that's what happens yeah. so the, the weak die in times of hardship and pestilence and and pandemics and 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 the ones that survive have the stronger genes so the human race gets stronger and stronger and stronger and so although on an individual level it's horrible if people die of this i mean if it swept over the world and killed five percent of the population it would be horrible but number one, I don't know if you, if that's going to happen. I don't know if you can stop it because we live together. We're interconnected, and it would strengthen the species. Not I mean, I'm not a eugenicist or anything, but it, you know, as a factual matter, it's not the end of life on the earth. You know, and people are going to die anyway of the flu and other things. So I, I just thought we should have done nothing and let people that are really vulnerable just stay inside. That's... I mean, I always thought that was the right approach, but. That's not the approach society took. For some reason, they panicked this time. Well, yeah, and especially if you have experts making arbitrary decisions based on, you know, whatever. It, it's it just like intervening and playing God with people's lives. Is well, not only that, we've totally short-circuited. We short-circuited the free market. So, like, now the government's paying for everything. It's like, when did yeah. this? And now everyone's saying, well, the U.S. shouldn't be so stingy with their – they should give it to the rest of the world. So we're supposed to – inoculate all seven billion people in the world and there people say well yeah because america it's in america's interest uh for other countries to be inoculated because if we don't kill it around the world it's going to come back here and like is it in their fucking interest to stop it there too i mean why do we why does the one country in the world that wastes its citizens money on bombing the rest of the world have to also give them the vaccine it's like <laughs> i was gonna say it's own. the same excuse for like the war on terrorism or the war on on drugs and like you, the first point that I thought is like you hit it is like the whole economic part of it and having creative destruction and having boom and bust when they're meant to and not have them carry on because of, of stimulus. It's it, uh, yeah, you like you need to let these things die and be destroyed because it's a poor allocation of, of time and resources and it's not favoring the market. So are you? Let me ask you. Are you pumped about uh, which of the which of the main works are you or do you like like uh, Safety and Moose's book and you know VJ Boy Patty uh, has got this Bill case great. for Bitcoin coming out. Oh, is he doing a, another one or is he just turning it into a book? He's turning it into a book, and uh, he's, I think he's almost done. I think it's going to be great. I think it's going to be very influential and seminal because that his article already was. So he beefed it up and yeah. turned it into a little, a little monograph. You know, like eight. It, pages, it deserved so. that because so much happened in two years or three years since he wrote Correct. that piece. Um, and I've been re-listening to it just because on Clubhouse I recommend it to people all the time because if they just ask like simple questions to where I just get impatient and i just feel like it's stupid i'm just like can't talk to you until you read this piece come back to me when you're done <laughs> and have like dm that link to people what like I kinda, as well what i kind of like about bitcoin is it's an area i'm like an i'm like an amateur on and so when i i'm always like you know an audience member kind of guy except when i talk about property theory and stuff but you know over these years i've always been like one of the one of the speakers and one of the experts on libertarian theory so i'm always on no stage but like you like understand you are like 90 percent there in your understanding i think and so yeah it like but 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 i go to clubhouse and i hear these guys that are these cocksure so-called experts and they usually are they know a lot more than me about technology the tech the, well i don't think there really is an expert like there are people that like in your case like you have a niche and, and like you're specialized in what you do 
and people have that in Bitcoin, but you know, I don't re- really think I have like a special speciality in Bitcoin because Bitcoin forces you to be like a Renaissance Correct. man. But I, but, but as I, long so as you I, understand the principles of sound money, whether or not that was like Satoshi's vision, I think is highly debatable that it was. If you look at what was in the, you know, Chancellor on Brink for a second bail over banks, that message in the Genesis block, like fixing money, I, I do think will, if not fix the world in everything, it's going just because you have the realignment of incentives that uh, that prevents all the corruption of having a m- monopoly over the money supply i mean that 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 fixes so much and you don't need to understand all the principles of sound money but if it just becomes a default people will live it and realize what works best just because like that's how markets work and innovation works yeah, and, and I think that actually Bitcoin is in a way teaching people Austrian economics because most of the people in yeah. it were that. So it's it's been great. And so you have these people that have never read much economics and they're reading because like safe, Austrian economics is the default of human nature. Well, but people don't know that. So in the economics profession in the mainstream world, that's considered a crank odd thing. But now so people are reading like Safedine's book and things like that and big VJ stuff, and they're hearing Austrian economics presented these economics, and they just think, oh, okay, that's what economics is. So there, it's sort of a way to surreptitiously introduce Austrian economics and even libertarianism to the world because we have this – you know, we're criticizing the state and the wars and the drug war and, and the Federal Reserve and all this kind of stuff. Um, but in one of these clubhouse rooms, some of these guys are really cocky, and you know, they'll, they'll, just, <laughs> they'll just kick you out if you've mentioned a shit coin and – one of these guys was just – he was – like they shit talk too. One was like – he just said, oh, all these retards read Safedine's stupid book. And I thought he was being sarcastic or joking, but I, I just raised my hand. I said – I was I a just Bitcoiner said, that said this? Yeah, yeah, hardcore one. I forgot his name, but – and and I said, I think uh, I think Bitcoin Tina was on, and he and I are kind of friends. And I, I, I texted him behind the scenes. I said, why did the guy say that? Is he serious? He goes, ask him. So I raised my hand and, and, and Bitcoin Tina let me on and I said, Hey, just curious, why did you say Safanina Moose's book is is retarded or stupid? And he goes, Well, because he doesn't understand money and all this kind of stuff. And and he goes, he goes, Why do you think it's so good? I said, I didn't say anything. I just asked you a question, man. I I, I honestly haven't even read the whole book because I already know Austrian economics, you know, and I already know Bitcoin. I I read through it and I what I read, it seemed pretty sound to me, um, but I wasn't defending it. I was just asking you a simple question. Why do you say that? And of course, he, he just said, well, he's bad on money, the history of money or something. I'm like, you know, I wanted to say what, but I, I just was curious what he meant. Or I was really curious if he was serious, but he was serious. So I had not heard much criticism of SAFE. That's why I was surprised. I heard one lady told me she thinks he's overrated, which okay, that's fine, maybe. But but he's the only he's the only solid systematic thing out there so far. So yeah, you know, maybe someone else will do something better someday. But I don't, I doubt it because he knows Austrian economics pretty well. I I can just like speculate where I think that guy was coming from, but there's a lot of people, and I, I tend to agree with this that uh like no, nothing beats like sound money and how sound money came to be but there was still an element of barter because there's that book like the five thousand years of, of debt and i think that was like very much present and maybe he thinks that argument is stronger than like oh people collected uh heirlooms and then those gain value and then they use those as medium of exchange and then it became their unit of account but I think that like debt was always there as well, and people did favors for each other, and at some point they had to like repay or something. But I I, I don't think that one outweighed the other, or one happened and one didn't. But again, this is just like my my speculation. I've heard other yeah. people say that uh you know economies like have been relying on on debt, and I I tend to agree with that. I haven't looked as much into it. But um, I don't know. Maybe that's where he was coming from. Yeah, maybe. So I want to talk to you about LARPitarians because 
What is all it? The, tell me what, tell me I've heard that term. Tell me exactly what that is. Oh, well, I that's just role play I mean, right? Uh, yeah, well LARPing. I I create just invented I should patent it. I I invented larpitarian the term just now. <laughs> but um uh, I probably didn't. But I'm just curious what you kind of think of that uh recently well, tell me what what is larping well, tell me what that means yeah live so action role sure. playing it's just like as a libertarian you're negating how great bitcoin is and you might favor more of like the bitcoin cash thing or you want to free market oh. money and but like because these libertarians don't get bitcoin it's just like well you're just bitching to bitch and we have a solution that then that we can like implement you know um yeah like uh i think if i know what you're talking about uh there's the eric july thing and I didn't. I never understood what. I, I didn't. I guess I didn't follow what he had said previously that he was. I, I didn't either. I I just kind of use it as like a a broad umbrella example. But just in, well, in general, like like the. I know my the, my friend Jeff Tucker. I think he was one of the ones who at first was like whining and complaining about the split <laughs> and how the small blockers won and how. You know. Oh, it ruined the ability to make payments, and like I honestly, from the beginning. Oh, the thing I wrote last night, this 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 uh, this comment on my blog, it was an it was an it was an email I wrote to Walter Block in December 2011, and in, and in, and that was where I wrote. I said, you know, it was about money, and I said something like I said I said actually in a sense Bitcoin is almost the ideal money because it's it's like gold but better. It so is. like I even saw it. I wish I had like said. I should buy some of this because it might catch on. But yeah. anyway, um, um, I never thought it would be – like I was going – I went to the Bitcoin conference in 2013, and they were like – had all these people. And I went to some things in New Hampshire a couple years after that, and they had like a vending – oh, fuck. I went to Porkfest. There was a vending machine in the woods for Bitcoin, and then you know they're selling T-shirts for – there's a barcode thing, and I'm like – I tried it a couple of times just to try to learn it, but I thought it was just silly activism because they're trying yeah. to force you to use it. They they had this thing about, oh, like Roger Ver, oh, when's the last time you use Bitcoin? I was like, <laughs> why the fuck would I use it when it's appreciating? You know? And why would you need to record on the blockchain for eternity a cup of a purchase of a cup of coffee at Starbucks? It just doesn't make any sense to me. It never made sense to me. And I never thought that the utility of it and the ca the, the case of it wor wording was to overturn dollars. First of all, it's taxed capital, so every transaction is a, a, a accounting nightmare. I mean, if you report it, well, and if you don't, then you're a scoff law. I mean, you know, so it's like it's just going to be an underground thing. It's like, uh, so I thought that the whole Bitcoin cash thing was ridiculous, and I also I've always been a skeptic of Hayek and this stupid. Competing currencies bullshit. My view is very Rothbardian, Hoppy, and Mazesian. I think that their money is a sui generis good. It's not a capital good, not a consumer good. It's not a good of the type of which increasing the supply increases consumer wel welfare or wealth. Um, so I believe with Mises that any supply of money is optimal, and once you get there, you should never change it at all. And with gold, we have to tolerate that because it's a non-perfect money. It's better than nothing, but it's un imperfect because it has a it has a non-monetary value, which means it's a waste. It is being used for money, and also it's an incentive to mine it, which is a wasteful activity, and it causes inflation. And it maybe sets in forth the Cantillon effect and business cycles and all that. I don't know, but at least causes inflation and a redistribution of wealth, which I think is bad. I don't think it's immoral, and I don't think it's – a rights violation because it's done privately, but it's still imperfect. So Bitcoin is like approaching the ideal. It doesn't have a non-monetary use, and it can't inflate beyond 21 million at all. So it's perfect. Um, so that was always my thought about it. So these people that say, oh, well, you can have one money for smart contracts and one money for small change and one money for privacy and one money for <laughs> color coins and one money for non-fungible tokens. That's it's fucking barter, stupid. stupid. <laughs> it's stupid. I mean the whole point of money is to you – know, a tendency to one money. You want one world. It's like ideally we'd have one language, right? One language in the world and one money, and everyone could communicate, and you have one internet, one network, and you have one – one size of rail gauge in the world. So all the train rails, when they go from country to country, they they can stay on the same rails. I mean, you know, common common protocols are good. Um, so consensus, think, bitches. 
Now, I, I am not persuaded that Bitcoin has anything special about it compared mm. to the other ones. I, I could be wrong, but I'm not persuaded. I think that if Bitcoin- I want to get into this. Well, because I think that like, you can't say that the block size is optimal. Maybe it should have been two. Maybe it should have been 32 megabytes. Maybe it should have been- But what is half. optimal is like what you said with Mises is that it is what it is. I'm not going to fuck with it. Well, the one thing I'm concerned about is that over time, the one megabyte block size will become effectively smaller in relative terms, right? So, but the, the, or it could the get war- bigger. But What's the, the point is, uh, sorry, no, sorry, because, just, no, just to because, cut in real quick. All right, go ahead. Go ahead. Is that whatever happens will change based on consensus of the entire network? Well, like, but no, what I, what I mean is it'll get effectively smaller because it'll be one megabyte, but processing power bandwidth will get bigger and bigger so it'll be uh-huh. effectively trivially small and if you wanted to increase it proportionate to technological development you'd have to change have a hard fork and i think the split in 2017 proved that that's now impossible so i i sort of wonder if it would have been better to have a variable block size like bsv has um not well, not for the reasons they want they want it so that you can have it go really big and have payments I don't think that's the reason. I think the reason would simply be so that it could it could easily adapt to increasing technology improvements. But maybe the maybe the anti centralizers are right that that'd still be a bad idea. But my point is, I think that whatever we have, it's good enough because it's still better than gold, and it's good enough to work as 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 the settlement layer. And so whatever it is, we'll we'll adapt to that, and it'll work. And I think it could have been Bitcoin Cash. I think it could have been Bitcoin God. Bitcoin, it could be Litecoin. It could have been any of those, I think. But Bitcoin well, now, has, I, now has the long chain and it's a network effect. Well, it also can't be anything else because everything else is centralized. Well, but if they had been more popular, would they still be as centralized? If they, were, if they had been popular, they still – yeah, they still would have been centralized. Because the decentralization of Bitcoin was very much, as you said, like proven in 2017, because like the consensus of the network went against the Bitcoin Cash narrative. Correct. But but if Bitcoin Cash had become dominant and Bitcoin Cash was worth a trillion dollars today and Bitcoin was now, you know, but like that wouldn't 10. have happened. Like this out the question. Correct. Like, so yeah, my hypothetical may be nonsensical. So um I'm just saying I think that Bitcoin – I think that you could only have one, and there should be one, and I think digital money is inevitable. Whether it's going to happen in this first attempt and iteration, I don't know. I suspect it might, and if so, it seems to me that it's going to be one, and the most likely one is going to be the one that's dominant now, which is Bitcoin. So yeah. So I think all this shitcoin stuff is, is ridiculous. I think this Hayekian competing currencies thing is stupid. Um, I think that the well, arguments that the Bitcoin cashers give are just stupid. They'll say things like, "Like Roger Ver, who I like, kind of, because he's libertarian." I do too. Like I, as shitty as he was, like I got mad respect for him. Like the hustle yeah, and like the he's, passion. He's anti IP. I think I actually gave him some Bitcoin, uh, some IP advice years ago before he was a billionaire, and <laughs> um, and but this stupid line he gave, like, "Wow, the." Uh, the ethos of Bitcoin is uh, free anti censorship. So, do you think that Reddit, when they censor, when the BT, the Bitcoin thread on Reddit censors people who talk about Bitcoin Cash, do you think that's compatible with censors? Because they're censoring people. It's like that's just a stupid argument. <laughs> and then the same thing is with, uh, oh, they'll say, oh, the word cash is in the title of the white paper. First of all, I don't care what the white paper says, you know. And second of all. Bitcoin is cash or will be cash if it's used as settlement. That's still cash by the definition. Yeah. So BJ Boy Potty's argument for that is like cash is something that is in of itself. Like uh, I don't know. I'm bastardizing what he says, but like I agree a hundred percent. And there's another thing they say which is stupid. Uh oh, the argument the BSVers give is like, well, you're anti-Austrian and anti-free market if you want to have a rule that prevents the free market from from supply and demand setting the size of the block. It's like like you no know, dumbass market. It's like you can have already. whatever rule you want that everyone agrees to. That's not anti-free market to have a fixed block size. It's just yeah. it's like if you play Monopoly 
and there's a, there's a fixed limit on the on the number of dollars on that board. That's not anti free market. It's just the rule of the game. Yeah. Uh, it's just stupid. These are just literally stupid arguments. The free speech yeah. argument and the censorship argument is stupid, and this free market argument is just stupid. Now, you could argue that it, it would work better to have a supply and demand thing and then let the market decide which one's better, and the market decided Bitcoin was better. Yeah. Okay. Maybe, the, maybe the market's wrong. It, maybe the market's wrong to adopt the QWERTY keyboard, and maybe the Dvorak keyboard's better. But you know what? <laughs> there's there's path dependency, and it's too costly to switch over now. So we're going to use the keyboard. It works fine. And Bitcoin dude, I, will work fine. I Googled the opinion. Dvorak keyboard, and I'm just like, why? What is this? I get like he wanted to like organize like the vowels and shit, but it's just like, oh. And there's, well, there's a, a thing where like the, where the typewriter. Or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I don't know. But yeah, well, no one's telling like, these people they can't do their super projects. We're just as Bitcoiners not gonna allow it on the Bitcoin network. Well, it's so, like, like you know, sayonara. if it, you know, if England is like an outlier because they drive on the left side of the road, probably it would have been better for them if they had switched to the right at some point early on. But it's too late now because it would it would cause massive societal disruption. So the price <laughs> they have to keep paying is they're different from the rest of the world. Yeah, and it's a pain in the ass for tourists to go there, and it's a pain in the ass for them to go to other countries when they drive and they get confused and causes wrecks. But apparently, it's not worth the cost to switch over. I think Japan did that, didn't they? I think Japan actually did that. They, in the '60s or something, they had a they had a day where everyone had to start driving the other side, and there was lots of wrecks. But they finally bit the bullet and did it. But it's hard <laughs> to do that. Wow. So uh, I think that they bastardized what Hayek said because bitcoin is is a free market money like it is basically an embodiment of what hayek was talking about and i think uh, so I, I i don't know i i don't think the ambassador is hayek i think i don't like hayek i think hayek is totally confused and wrong on this i disagree right, with this knowledge problem i'm one of these guys i think that everything hayek was good on it was, he was just a murky interpretation of mises and everything he was original on, he was bad on. I mean, I, I don't, I, I really don't, I'm not a Hayekian at all. See, J.W. Knowledge... Weatherman has the same argument, or I, I think it might be the same. So, like, can, can you just kind of further explain? I've got a blog post on my Stefan Kinsella site. Um, go to my, go to my, the series with my collected blog post. Like, it's under my, it's under my, um, my libertarian law and libertarian world link. I've got all the, and one of them is on the knowledge, knowledge and calculation. Like I think the knowledge problem, and all the all the Misesian Austrians like uh, Hoppe, Holzman, Salerno, Herbener, they all think that, uh, and Rothbard, they all think that Hayek was just the whole knowledge paradigm was wrong. Uh, the function of prices is not to convey knowledge, and it's 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 simply to provide a cardinal format that people can make uh, comparisons. To do economic calculation, and that depends on our property rights system. So it's not a conveyance of knowledge. I don't think prices are signals. They don't convey knowledge at all. Um, and I don't agree with his competing currency idea uh, at all. I think, again, it should just be one thing, and it should be the best fungible commodity in a broad sense that can serve that function. And it used to be gold, and now it's now it's Bitcoin. Okay, I think I'm having to to soul search right now. Read read, the, read that post. You read that post. You'll you'll you'll. It might cause you to ponder some things. Okay, uh, just real quick, can I ask you why prices are not like signals mm -hmm. in the market? Yeah. So, Dito Holzman writes best on this. So, so there are no such thing as prices current prices. There's only past prices, which are historical records of, of just the exchange someone engaged in, and there's future prices which don't exist, but they're the, for, they're the appraisal or the forecast in someone's mind. It's just a prediction. So if I, engage, if I want to engage in a project in the future, the future is uncertain, but I want to make a monetary profit, so I have to use my scarce resources. I have to allocate them towards some project. And there's multiple projects I could engage in, right? Like I could build a bridge, I could make a light bulb factory, I could make a restaurant, whatever. So what I have to do is I have to I have to try to guess what my monetary profit in the future would be. To do that, I have to guess what prices I'm what revenue I'm gonna make 
like what price I can charge for this product, and I have to guess what my costs are going to be. And those are all future things. So the only way to do that is to you, you imagine the most recent set of prices, and you extrapolate from there. So you take the, the most recent set of prices, which most people erroneously call current prices, and you, you, you say – you just try to calculate a delta, a difference. Like you say, okay, the price – so milk is like three times as expensive as eggs or whatever, and cows are – half as expensive as horses, you know, these kinds of things, given money prices right now. That's a relative indication of how the the higgling and the negotiation on the market resolves itself in terms of what people pay for these things, how they value them. Okay. But it doesn't tell you why they value them or what they know. So if I am selling like uh if I have a farm and I've I had I can grow wheat or I can grow corn. And I think there's going to be a corn – I think there will be a shortage of corn, or I think there will be an increase in demand for corn. Like maybe I think people will start using it to make ethanol, all right, and the demand will go up. So I might plant corn predicting that I, I will have a higher price for corn in the future than other people think. right? But – and when I do that, I bid up the price of corn because I buy, buy corn seeds and all that. So by – by making a judgment about what I think the future price will be, I set the current price. But that current price is not right or wrong. It's just a consequence of my knowledge, which is right. uncertain, and it's local knowledge. So the price reflects my knowledge, but my knowledge could be wrong. And someone else seeing the price of corn go up right now doesn't know why it's going up. They don't know if the price of corn is going up because… The demand for it is going up, which it is in this case because I have a higher demand for corn because of my belief of what the future is going to hold. So someone sees the price of corn go up. One reason for that could be that there's an increase in demand. Another reason could be there's a decrease in supply, or another reason could be there's a perceived increase in demand on my part. Like I could be wrong. <clears throat> well, yeah. Or there's a perceived increase. I could think there's an increase in – or decrease in supply, and I could be wrong. Like I could be wrong that there's a famine coming or, or, or a plague coming for corn um, in other countries, and so I'm going to grow more corn. So all these ideas that I have go into the change in the price, but they could be wrong or right, and they could be a change in supply or a change in demand. So someone observing this new price doesn't learn anything from it. All they learn from it is that… I am willing to pay this much for corn. Well, it sends them signals to whether or not to buy that versus the generic price or the generic brand, which is a cheaper price, right? No, so it, prices no, it are still like well, prices are still sending information and influencing people's decision on what what or what not to buy. And even if even if that price is reflective by your decision to like bid up the price of corn for this or that reason, is is that not still like a free market? solution and everyone has consensus it's a, around it's a free that market price. solution yeah it's a free market solution it, it converges in in the long run in an equilibrium fashion towards an optimal uh equilibrium however we never reset because the market's dynamic and always changing so there's always like an instantaneous tendency but you never get there right. it's just like a guiding force but you got to read that article on my on my blog by guido holzman he gives a good example about 10 and i quote from that so if let's say 10 becomes more scarce and people need 10 to make some things, right? Um, the reason they can't use 10 as much in production processes is not because the price went up, it's because there is less 10 to go around. Yeah. So so usually the decrease in supply of 10 or the increase in demand for it, either one, would cause the price to go up, and that price would mean people are simply less able to afford it because they don't have as much money to spend on it, so they would have to conserve it automatically. But the reason they're conserving it is because there's less of it to go around. It's not because of the price, So and, and the price can be wrong. So if, if the price of 10 but goes up… But that price is still being based on supply and demand. Maybe not. Right. It might. It, no, it's, it's really not. It's based upon my perception of supply and demand. So I'm the guy right. bidding the price of 10 up based upon my forecasts of the future. My forecast could be wrong. My, my project might turn out to be a loss in the future, which means that I changed the price of 10 in the wrong direction, and everyone responded to that in the wrong way. So 
What so did, ironically, it didn't convey, you, it didn't you convey had, information. It conveyed bad information. So in a way, you ironically in the free market were being a central planner that dictated incorrectly the price of tin. And that's just because corn. people are fallible and we're not omniscient and we don't know the future. Mistakes but are – But that's like mis- Hayek's argument, isn't it? I don't like think the so. The whole like road to serfdom thing. I mean like he oh. also talks about like the pricing mechanism as well, but then he also talks about like – you know, you can't have a central planning, like bureaucratic, like government thing. But what's better is that if you have like planners in the free markets make these solutions and we have consensus around like, like prices based on individual choice and subjective value. Um, well, I used to think that, but uh, the, so I'll send you two links that you or your, you or your listeners who are interested in this can, can read further. Yeah, but- totally. So one is this knowledge thing, and just read the quotes that I I selectively highlight from Hoppe and Holzman and these guys, and Rothbard, uh, and Salerno and Herbener, um, about Hayek and the Hayekians. And then also there was a huge debate in the late '80s and early '90s in the Review of Austrian Economics, and I've collected all the key resources in a blog post. It's called the Great, um, the Great. Um, let's see. The great, well, there's two. The great, yeah, the great Mises Hayek dehomogenization slash economic calculation debate. Now, the Hayekians, <laughs> what they've always argued is that when Hayek elaborated on the calculation problem that Mises laid out in 1920, I think it was 1921 in his um, economic calculation of the socialist commonwealth, and then in greater detail in his book, Socialism. Maybe it's 1919 or 20, and then the book was in 21 or 22. I forgot. But anyway, um, they always said that Hayek, when he talked about knowledge, was just either complementing that argument or supplementing it, or he was – when he talked about the knowledge signals and the knowledge prices, the dispersed knowledge, local knowledge, all that stuff, he was just describing the, the flip side of the coin. That's what like Pete Betke and Steve Horowitz and a lot of these Hayekians say. Uh, and I think that's actually wrong. I think that he's just – he went off on a wrong tangent, and he's misdescribing. He's losing the central point, and he's not adding anything useful to it. Now, they would vigorously disagree with me on this, but there was a whole debate on this, and you'll see there's a debate between the Rothbardians basically and the Hayekians. Um, and I basically am persuaded by the Rothbardians, although it's been 15 years since I read all this <laughs> stuff. <laughs> I want to revisit it, but there's so much to read now and so many clubhouse things to listen to. Yeah. Wait, so what is the main point that Hayek doesn't get? It's just what I'm talking about. So he thinks that he thinks that the problem is that um that the problem is that you can't coordinate because knowledge is local and it's tacit. By tacit he means there's things that we know but we can't articulate in language. Which is yeah. true. Like I might know how to ride a bicycle, but I can't tell you how to do it. I can maybe teach you, but I have to show you by demonstration. You, you have to learn it yourself. You can't really explain how you walk, even really, you know. Uh, yeah. Or like you know, like my mom is a good example. She's a great cook, but if I ask her how what a recipe is, she doesn't. She goes, "I just put a little bit of this, a little bit of that." You know, she knows how to do it. She has a skill, a talent, a knack, but she can't articulate it. So some knowledge is tacit. And some knowledge is local. Like only I know th- that there's a famine coming, or that there's a shortage of eggs because I'm a farmer. And so the the the, the consumer of eggs 100 miles away doesn't know there's a shortage of eggs. But by me raising the price of my eggs, I raise the price of eggs, and so he effectively learns that eggs have a shortage because the price signal conveys that knowledge. But I don't think it does convey it. All it conveys is that the price of eggs went up. The consumer only knows that. There is someone who thinks that the price of – there is someone who thinks that there's a shortage of eggs or that there's an increased demand of eggs coming. That's all they know. They don't know which one it is. They don't know if it's an increase in supply. I'm sorry, a decrease in supply or an increase in demand, and they don't know if I'm right. So it doesn't convey anything. All it conveys to them is that someone is not going to take the same price for eggs anymore. And that if they go to this seller, they have to pay his price. That's all they know. So, but the point is, if there really is a shortage of eggs, 
there are less eggs to go around, and people cannot use as many eggs as before. Whether the price signal is right or not, they can't. They just can't. Like if the price is too low, they're just going to run out of eggs soon. There will be a shortage of eggs, and then the price will have to adjust because people will realize. So, and then this thing about so the idea of, of the tacit knowledge is that you don't know how to explain it, but your actions on the market codify your knowledge in numerical terms because you know if i know how to cook a recipe i don't know how to explain it but i might go buy the ingredients and when i buy those ingredients that helps alter the price of those ingredients and that knowledge is then conveyed in encoded form see i'm an engineer an electrical engineer and i'm used to like actually thinking of signal encoding and encryption and transmission of data over fiber optic cables and through modems modulator demodulators and to me, signal encoding is a precise term. It means a knowing actor has information he wants to transmit, and so he encodes it in a, by, by a known scheme or schema and transmits it to be, tra to be decoded at the other end and understood. Like if I write a book, I'm putting words on paper according to a schema, the alphabet and the language schema, and someone else with a dictionary effectively can decode it at the other end. That's all intentional and rational. To, to make a metaphor and an analogy and say that prices encode information is extending a metaphor too much. And this is where we always get into trouble when we, oh. when we overdo metaphors. Um, so yeah. it's wow. deeper than that, and that's about all I can do to explain it being this rusty on it. But if you're curious, just dip into that dehomogenization economic calculation debate, and you'll see – and, and that blog post, and I'll send you the links if you want to dive into it or put them on your show notes. That's and really I need interesting. To go in about, I need to go in about five or ten minutes, by the way. Yeah, I felt like we were going a little over. Wow. But th that example was – yeah, it, it took like a literal approach, and like there is a process into decoding why something happens. And then it's almost like high comes at it in like almost a metaphysical way like you know we don't know maybe maybe yeah, i'm just, just I mean, we could be wrong but just think about it it's, it's it's a fascinating debate yeah i like that yeah i i'll be happy to take a look at those and put them in the show notes very cool i think wow how long it's been like an hour and a half jesus this has been great i thoroughly enjoyed this chat um just one one last thing. Uh, as the Bitcoin price is doing what it does, I'm sure you're maybe getting more people your age that are into Bitcoin asking you about it. Like, yeah, I'm it, I'm the expert in my circles, which is scary, but yeah, yeah I'm right? the expert. Yeah, how how many questions and how how do you like describe Bitcoin to Gen Xer or a Boomer? Just, just like what have the questions been like and how how's their mm. their feedback been well you know it, it always comes up and they always have the they always have the confusing misconceptions like the elementary things you have to correct you know like oh i don't have to buy a whole bitcoin you know that kind of stuff or how do i buy it you know or wait how how do if it's a separate thing how do you how do you get some? I say you buy it. Well, where do you buy it? On an exchange, you know, you can trade. Let's current like a currency exchange. People trade money for they there's off there's on ramps and off ramps. There's dollar fiat currency off ramps and on ramps. So you, it's like the basics. And then you explain the then you explain how it's a fixed supply, but then you explain how some has been lost, and then you explain how it's growing asymptotically every four years by the difficulty adjustment and the and the mining, the block, the block reward being adjusted, and the and the difficulty adjustment every two weeks. So, and then you have to explain encryption, and then you have to explain what a wallet is and how you can store it in a custodial thing, or you can do it yourself. And that it's not on your it's not on your trezor, but it holds the key. So it's kind of difficult, right? But because we all went through this mind bending thing for a few years of agony trying to understand it and 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 seeing the kind of learning process like a bitcoin finally learned that it wasn't a payment thing you know we i think the 2017 thing helped us learn more about its store of value function and the settlement 
nature layer of it and how it can how hyper bitcoinization can happen and then you go into the what its potential future value could be like if it displaced gold and what's the what's the free market value of gold and if it replaced that then it might be worth this many dollars per coin right and that ultimately you wouldn't even have to sell it for dollars because you could just spend your bitcoin in this enclosed bitcoin economy um and then you tell them what's happened the last 11 years has 200 percent a year and how every time you tell them to buy they say oh but i missed it at the top it's fifty five thousand dollars now i say yeah but when i told you when it was twenty six thousand, you said the same fucking thing and when it was thirteen thousand, you said the same thing it was when it was five thousand, you said the same thing and when it's a hundred thousand, you're gonna say, I wish I'd listened to you when it's fifty-five, you know. So say just buy now and hold it and forget it for three years or five years. But don't buy it if you're gonna get nervous and sell it if it falls, or if you're gonna get greedy and sell it if it if it goes up. You gotta buy it and hold it for five years and ignore it no matter what happens. And so only put into it something you can afford to lose and it won't make you nervous. And some people can't do that. Some people will sell it if it goes up, and they'll sell it if it goes down. So it's like, well, then why buy it? You know, they want to go home and tell their wife, "Oh, I made twenty five percent in th in two months." So it's like, yeah, then it's going to go up another five hundred percent. You're going to kick yourself for having sold it like an idiot. Or if it falls, they'll sell it at a loss and they'll panic, and then they 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 hate you because they lost money. And they'll say, "Well, you weren't supposed to buy it if you weren't going to hold it for five years." You know, I guess that's the rough advice all Bitcoiners give to normies. Right? That was the best. <laughs> Just the chronology, that was perfect. Like, so succinct. Like, you probably don't want to tell a newbie all that at once. But if yeah. I just I just clipped everything you said and gave it to him, I think that suffice. Yeah. <laughs> like, wow. And you could do that in an hour, maybe. Or, you know. Yeah. Huh. Okay, so how, how many people have you actually done that to? Or just like what have been mm, typical conversations like been like like probably examples a, out of your life? A couple dozen, like in-laws, close friends, uh family members. Uh yeah, probably a couple dozen. And, and do they get it? Like what's the reception been like? Most of them and, and, and the higher the price goes, the more they get it, I find. Yeah. Um and the longer it's been around. Um and the more the more public awareness it's getting, like now they're saying, "Oh, Stefan, you're right. All these exchange, all all these institutional investors. Are, I'm hearing it on regular news now. You you're right. I'm like, yeah, we've been saying this for several years. It's going to happen in waves. It's going to be adopted in waves. Like, it'll get one price. It'll catch people's attention, and then they're going to start investing, and that'll bid the price higher up. And then an another level of people that were old fogies will notice. And you know, that's our that's our that's our prediction about what might happen." And then, and then there, and then there's always the wolf. The government shut it down. I'm like, well, did they? Sh China shut it down. Did it kill it? China, China bans Google on the internet. Did it kill it? Um, uh, Uber, Uber didn't ask permission, and they fi they're finally unbannable because they built in a constituency. A lot of congressmen have nephews and kids that have Bitcoin now. Some of them might have Bitcoin. You know, it, it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna attach itself like a parasite to everyone. It's gonna be too late to kill it. That's how I got into Bitcoin. BJ told me in 2012. I said I loved it. I just think that it was it was 10 bucks. It was like it was 13 bucks. And I said it's going to crash by the end of the year because if it goes up, the government's going to kill it. And he said, "You want to bet hundred dollars?" Yeah. I said, "Okay." So I said, "I'll bet a hundred dollars that in a year it'll be one twentieth of its current value, sixty five cents." So about six months later, it was like thirty bucks, and I said, "Oh fuck, I've lost." <laughs> so I said, let me go ahead and pay you now, VJ. Hundred dollars. If he just said, I tell you what, if you give me three bitcoins, I'll call it even. And there were 30 bucks each, so I could save ten dollars. So I bought I bought five bitcoins on Coinbase while I was setting it up. So I gave him his three. And but he was doing that to nudge me into getting into it. He was sneaky. Yeah. So I, I owe him well, he owes me hundred fifty thousand dollars right now, but you know. I owe him for getting me into it. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. Awesome. I'm I'm out of shit to talk about, but this was awesome, Stefan. Uh, go ahead and not that you need to. I'm sure people know where to find you, but just 
show all your 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 stuff where people want to find you if you're if you got any cool stuff coming out or whatever well i've got a book coming out law and libertarian world sometime this year hopefully oh, um exciting. it'll be it'll be kind of an edited selection of my kind of theoretical articles on libertarian property theory and stuff um um so my main site is stephanconsolo.com, and all my IP stuff, I kind of shunted off into a separate site called C4SIF, C, the number four, which stands for Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom.org, C4SIF.org. So if you're interested in IP stuff, go there, and just libertarian theory, stephanconsolo.com. Awesome. When the book comes out or is about to, I'd love to have you back on to talk about that. We got into some to. of the property stuff, but I did want yeah. to ask more about like the – natural law versus like objectivism and, yeah. and the we ethics of liberty stuff be happy to awesome seven thanks for your time been very generous okay, man. and i've thoroughly enjoyed this chat man all right i'll send you the file shortly you bet peace out all right bye